always feel like when the children leave, something of the energy of the congregation goes. <laughs> uh, especially when you've got Christmas coming up. I want to welcome you. It's so good to see so many people, a lot of faces I've seen. I see you maybe a couple of times a year uh, who come for special events here. It's always a pleasure. And some new faces. Uh, we welcome you. A warm St. Matthew welcome. And we're so honored to have you with us today. I, I also want to thank our musicians ahead of time. Uh, for Jamie and Brian and um, each of the vocal musicians and our instrumentalists uh, who have worked very hard for this day and Brian in particular in writing this piece and this is you're the first to get to hear this presentation of it. Uh, thankful, thank you each for your dedication and your long hours for doing this and uh, may it be an act of praise first to God because that's why we sing uh, but second may our hearts also be blessed by it. Well, writer and preacher Barbara Brown Taylor <clears throat> has described John the Baptist as the Doberman Pincher of the Gospels. <laughs> he always appears right before Christmas as we're making our way to the manger and interrupts our journey to it. We can see the stable out ahead of us, out there, not too far from us. We're almost there when we out of the blue comes, Grrr! and a dog comes and bites us in the ankle, and uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> ankle. <laughs> didn't say it. the ankle. <laughs> bites us in the ankle and says to us, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. And then our minds are swirling with, with all kinds of things. They're swirling with axes and judgment and fire. And, whoa. and we were just trying to make our way to the stable and stand around the manger and sing, O Holy Night. But we get John. John stops us like a dog determined not to allow us to go any further. Because if you can't handle John, you're not going to be able to handle Jesus when he comes. If you can't hear John's message, how are you going to hear what Jesus has to say to us? John, in other words, is the watchdog who's making sure no one wanders into the holy precincts unaware. In other words, John is the one who wants to wake us up, to shock us into thinking, oh, my goodness, the unconscious ways we live our lives, the unconscious attitudes that we have towards one another, the, the ways that we think about uh, God and our, our, our real lack of belief that holds us back in being able to believe anything new is possible, which is what Jesus comes to bring. Jesus comes to bring that newness, new possibilities for life. But we struggle to be able to receive him. I don't know about you, um, John and Jesus come together, but maybe in your household it is a sin to pass the salt without the pepper. Well, John is the pepper. Sometimes we just want the salt, but you got to take the salt and the pepper together. And this is the good news of the gospel. And it's only good news when we can first hear some of the darkness, something of the evil that we contend with. Because that's what light comes into, that darkness. John was there, and it's good to remember that John did not come to us as a, uh, a person trying to convert us to Christianity. John the Baptist was a Jew speaking to Jews <laughs> with the understanding that the kingdom of God was coming and we had to get ready for it. And John was simply shouting out and telling us that now is the time to turn the way that you're going because the people were headed in a wrong direction. So far afield that they might find themselves lost in a way that they cannot return. And John says, wait up, wake up, look at what's happening, turn a different direction, because there is one more powerful than to me who can change everything that we thought not changeable. Now, for contemporary Christians, I have always felt that when I say the word repentance, you need to repent, it's almost like we all have hearing aids and we just want to turn them off at that point, right? I don't want to hear it because... Repentance brings up images of old-time gospel, of a gospel of hell and fire and damnation and condemnation, 
of a gospel that teaches us to feel bad about who we are because we're fundamentally uh, sinful and flawed. I remember uh, when I was a young child, I used to um, um, I always have a part of me that didn't really like Communion Sunday. We always had a first Sunday in the little Methodist church I went to. And I kind of dreaded it because Communion was that time where I was supposed to kind of come to the altar and feel kind of bad. If I didn't feel a little bit bad about myself, I, I really wasn't repenting. And it was also the time where I had to come up with that list in my mind of the things I had done wrong since the last time I've received communion that I need to ask forgiveness for. You know, like, like I hit my brother this week, I, I yelled at my mom, I didn't mow the lawn, <laughs> yawn, uh, lawn when my dad asked me to, and you know, I've thought awful thoughts about that bully at school and things that could happen to him. And I would come and I'd hear the ritual, and the ritual at the time in the Methodist Church, a part of it went something like this. It said, we do not presume to come to thy table, Lord. Uh, we are only worthy to gather up the crumbs underneath it. And it felt like that's the way I had to come, to crawl to a table as someone who had this list of things that I had come up with that I had done that I need forgiveness for. In other words, it wasn't always about good news, repentance. But that's not at all the meaning of repentance. The true meaning of repentance is not about just simply a list of things that we've done wrong. As when you go to confession, those of you who are former Catholics or Catholics. It's not just about listing the things we've done. It goes more deeper than that. True repentance is about those deeper attitudes of the heart. This year we're talking about the attitudes of the heart, the positive ones. Uh, the, the, now we're talking about peace this month. And Thanksgiving and generosity was last month. But there are also negative attitudes of the heart that are destructive, that, that fundamentally challenge our belief and our living, our relationship with Christ. Our belief that maybe um, there is a God that we cannot fully believe in, that we don't fully trust to be in our lives. And that's what John was concerned about, not just the specific things that people were doing, but also those fundamental hearts, things that keep us separated from God, that are a denial of the power and the goodness of God in our lives. And I dare say, in our modern times, one of those attitudes that I think we all have a bit of in all, in our, within ourselves is an attitude of despair. That's that sense that there's just something broken within me or broken within our world that just cannot be fixed. Try as I may, try as I might, there is nothing I can do about it. A place where we feel a bit hopeless. And for some of us, maybe that despair is... is is a part of us that's a small area of our life that doesn't consume us, but it's an area that we've learned maybe just to live with. That bit of, well, I sure wish that could change. I wish there was a possibility for something different, but that's just the way things are, and I'm going to have to put up with it. That part of us that has somehow given up on a loving and forgiving God. But in my ministry, and in the ministry of other pastors and therapists that I have talked to over the years, Sometimes that despair, despair is brutal. I remember it may be a man who is middle-aged who doesn't see a way of fixing the marriage that he's in. Deeply enmeshed in a family and a, and a marriage that people, he loves at some level very deeply, but also feeling hopeless because it's a contentious marriage. It's a marriage that Time and time again, the same issues boil up and boil up and never seem to resolve themselves. He looks at his two young adult children and noticing that neither one of the girls have been able to leave the fly the coop, even though they're in their 20s, because of a, mir a mirage of problems that they have. And he feels a failure as a husband and as a dad. And he wonders what he should do. Should he leave? But how can he leave a family that is so dependent on him, that's so much a part of who he is, but how can he possibly stay with the despair that he feels? Or maybe it's a little girl I heard about from another pastor who was abused by her grandfather, and 40 years later, 
Although it's, he's long and gone and daddy still has his hands on her. And she's not able to trust and to risk being in a relationship with anyone else because she made a, a commitment to herself. She had never, ever, ever let down her guard and trust anyone like that again because she knows that she could possibly be hurt. Or maybe it's the bit of despair we feel that we look at the world in which we live now, where we see the fundamental break between our people and our nation, between our politicians, but which represent really us. The parts of us that don't feel like we can find common ground on anything, even though if you were to survey people, you could find a whole list of common things we, we would agree upon, but they don't seem to be able to be approved by our Congress. And we feel this bit of nagging sense of what in the world's going to happen? We see this Christmas racism rearing its head in a way we thought we were done with, but still very much present with us. Now we have people that we've always looked up to, maybe even admired, liked, respected, discovering that they've been guilty of all kinds of misconduct and abuse. And we're wondering, when does this end? I feel a despair when I think of Christians who are good Christians, but I think they must be rather unconscious in some ways because they're destroying the Christian witness, maybe not even aware that they're doing that. When they put above the integrity of a good morality, um, political power. I think if we can't draw the moral line, if we cannot draw that moral line with protection of our children, protection of our young people from abuse, where in God's sakes do we draw that line? Cynicism, it can be everywhere. Part of us, but part of the world in which we live. I don't mean to be a downer, because I didn't ask for this scripture. This is electionary scripture. I always include it, because it's necessary. We have to go by John before we come to Jesus. Before we make the manger scene, we have to hear the bad news and be able to name those parts, those attitudes of our heart that are part of who we are, those places of despair, because if we can't name them, we'll come to that stable, we will see a beautiful baby, our hearts will open up, we will sing carols, and we'll be excited about it, and we'll walk away, but we will have never met who that baby truly is, the Lord and Savior who comes into this world to break through the despair, to bring new possibilities of life, new possibilities for the nations. But it requires this ability to say, oh, we've got to turn a new direction if we're to receive this one. If we are to believe that there is one who has that power. When I think about the coming of Jesus, I think about the coming of my uh, father-in-law. <laughs> Marlon's going to laugh at this one. Uh, but uh, my father-in-law uh, is not Jesus. He's a very good man. But when he and uh, my mother-in-law come to visit us, they, they could fly on marvelous passes, but they almost always drive. Because he likes to bring his tools. He likes to bring them to the house. Because he knows we'll probably have some projects that need some work. And usually there's something that we've got planned that we're going to have him take care of, and he's going to fix it. And when he goes home, ha, ah. <laughs> We found what needed to be fixed, and he fixed it. But sometimes, and this happened recently, he goes home and goes, oh my goodness, we had that, that sliding door that we can never quite get fixed. He could have fixed it, or we didn't have him fix the outlets that are, need to be replaced as electricity. <coughs> That's what he comes to do, to fix things. The Christ who comes is coming to fix that which is broken. And what is broken is not just the small things that we've done or not done. It's the deeper attitudes of the heart that places of despair. He comes to fix it and bring the new possibilities for life and new life. And unless we name those places, we will not meet the Christ child when we sing O Holy Night. 
Our cantata is based on peace, which is the theme for this month. It's a brilliantly uh, written piece, and I think you will find great joy in the music that Brian has prepared for us. Remarkable uh, accomplishment to, to write that. But I want you to notice that this is not one of those, oh, let's get in the happy Christmas spirit kind of pieces of music. Whatever the Christmas spirit is, I think it's deeper than that. It involves something of the pepper of John the Baptist, but also the salt. So I invite you as you hear these words and hear the music to listen for the pepper, but also to hear the salt, the light of Christ breaking through. 